sixth chapter of Luke. We had uh, gotten down to verse 27 last time. And what we have here is a shorter version of the Sermon on the Mount. A few different uh, uh, recordings of uh, and a little very different variation on some of the familiar sayings. But certainly what we recognize from the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus had uh, chosen the twelve, come down uh, to a flat spot, and a great crowd was there. He healed many of them, and then he began to teach. Uh, Then what we found was the familiar uh, Beatitudes, and uh, we had blessings. We also had, uh, in Luke, basically a, a symmetrical number of woes. And uh, so we see that what God blesses and what God does not. And in all of these, it was exactly the opposite of the world's order of things and the world's view of what is good and what is to be avoided. And so uh, then he goes on with this uh, world upturning message in verse 27, where we start tonight. He says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To someone who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Give to everyone who begs of you. And from uh, the one who takes your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish for others to do to you, do to them. Well, that ending there, Uh, we recognize as the golden rule, and uh, we uh, certainly teach our children to follow that. I'm not sure how well we model it all the time, but we certainly teach our children to please follow that. But uh, we just note uh, uh, what it says, uh, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Uh, What does the world say in this regard? And actually... In the longer version, in Matthew, how did Jesus preface such statements as, uh, love your enemies and do good to those who hate? What did he say? You've heard it said. You've heard it said said, uh, that you should uh, hate your enemies. Is there any place in the book of God that says to hate your enemies? Well, if it's not, why would they have heard it said? But if it was said, wouldn't we be able to pretty easily put our finger on it? So uh, the the old book, the old Bible, the Old Testament comes kind of close. Certainly it speaks of God's hatred of a number of things, of actions, of individuals, of people. And so uh, we do have God's hatred expressed in the Old Covenant a number of times you can find it of things that God hates and is an abomination to him, uh, primarily in the the, the Pentateuch, in the Psalms and and, and and Proverbs. What you don't ever find is you don't ever find an instruction to hate. So there is the fact that God does hate a thing, and uh, uh, generally, shouldn't we have God's opinion on a thing? If God holds a thing in disdain, how should we, how should we, uh, how should we hold it and esteem it? So we'll say it will come pretty close, and it wouldn't take much of a logical leap. It wouldn't take much of uh, you know the teacher, uh, you know, making standing and making a point and working up a bit of a lather on a point to get to hate your enemies. But Jesus here explicitly says the opposite. You are going to love your enemies. You're going to do good to those who hate you. Blessing those who curse you. Praying for those who abuse you. And so here's a a positive course of action. There's love from the heart. There's doing good, which would be practical things. There's blessing, uh, which is speaking well of, in, in the presence of. And then praying, and that is seeking concern for them uh, in your uh, communication with God. So all of those are active things to do. 
And we find this would be a very hard thing to do because it's to enemies, those who hate you, those who curse you, and those who abuse you. And then if they hit you, what do you do? Turn the other cheek. And then if they take from you, what do you do? Give them more. All right. Uh, is that how we will, that, that's how we need to approach this last election. The political season we just went through, we needed to do this. Uh, this is how we need to approach the mugger on the street. This is how we approach the panhandler that we go by on a semi-regular basis. Or not. Or what, Are there qualifications of this or, or what do we do? I think in uh, seeing how this would actually look and apply, how did Jesus himself live? How did Jesus himself live? He didn't really defend himself very much, and he certainly didn't hold his possessions very closely. He did not. He didn't. uh, When when they were uh, scheming against him, did he scheme back? He didn't, no. Um, the Apostle Paul, a great follower of Christ, an example for brethren, did he present much of a legal defense at trials? Well, yeah. More than Jesus, for sure. But it wasn't really, I'm innocent of all these charges, right? Uh, it was, let me tell you what this is really about. This is about the gospel. That's why I'm here. Um, G, uh, now, there is a couple of occasions where the most notable is the Apostle Paul. What happens when he realizes he's not going to get a fair trial in one case, and he sees that the people who are judging him are divided between Pharisee and Sadducee? What does he do? He, he, and what's his trump card? I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee. That's right. I'm a historical Pharisee. You guys know me. And, and the thing is, in that room, a lot of those people would have known Paul. They really would have. Uh, now, it would have been 20 years ago, but they, 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 would, they knew who he was. And he got them fighting amongst themselves. Uh, this is not saying I don't think we can have any protection for ourselves or seek any protection for ourselves. There's a couple of times where Jesus and the apostles both were able to get away with a few things in the sight of the Jewish authorities in broad daylight in the temple square itself. Because why? Who did the authorities fear? People. They feared the people. And whose people? Who, no, the people were on Jesus' side, weren't they? And they were on the apostles' side. Because they go around doing good and healing people and doing miracles. And there's a couple of occasions where it says that the Jewish authorities uh, feared uh, the people. And so those were some people who, uh, you know, would come to Jesus' aid and protection. Now, having known that, when did Jesus ever rally the troops and say, go get them, boys? He didn't. He said, y'all go attack that side of the temple while I slip out this side door over here. He didn't do that either. So it's not that there was never any cunning or craft or wisdom uh, in seeking to uh, not be abused more, not be mistreated more, uh, but there is a great limit, is there not, into what both Jesus... And the apostles did as far as any kind of uh, physical retribution, right? And uh, the, uh, the prayer, I think about, it says pray for those who abuse you. In Acts chapter uh, 4, the apostles uh, uh, were uh, put on trial uh, for doing good and for preaching about Jesus. And uh, uh, they said that... Uh, uh, you know, when they were, well, when they were released in, in Acts chapter 4, uh, they went and prayed together, and they prayed that God take note of everything that was going on, which I think is a prayer we can always say, God take note of the injustice. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't give God suggestions uh, of how he might smite these people. Right? I'm sure uh, you think about Peter and some of the other apostles in their prior life as fishermen. Do you think they could have come up with inventive ways for God to have gotten on to those folks? Oh, yeah. 
Uh, one time they did suggest that God uh, send, send uh, uh, destruction from above. And so what we find is that this is a general attitude. Uh, this is a peaceful attitude. Uh, this is not one who gets defensive. Uh, this is not one who is petty in any way. And this is not one that is always uh, defending their honor or seeking retribution or the like. And as we talked about before, how many things escalate when people get defensive, when people act from a position of being insulted, uh, and, uh, you know, they, uh, for, for all that we talk about, you know, this uh, legacy of the old South that uh, people want to get over today, but just insult them, and all of a sudden they go full foghorn leghorn, Sorry, so you have insulted my honor, sir. You know, they just revert right back to that and like, oh, come on. Um, and they, they just, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they print around like uh, Foghorn Leghorn when he's been, he's been insulted. And so that is not the Christian way. And that is not the way that Jesus or the apostles conducted themselves. So uh, you sum it all up with the golden rule of Honoring others or treating others as you would wish to be treated. Uh, the majority of people in this world, I think, really do follow the reflective rule. Uh, the way that they are treated is the way they treat. There are people who are having a bad day. There are people who are careless and abusive and, and insensitive. Uh, most people probably aren't that way even all the time. Some are more than others. But the majority of people, it's, it's really a reflective uh, view. Uh, it's a reflective action. What you do to with them is what they'll do back. And you can, you can run that experiment. I wouldn't do it because, you know, there are, there are uh, ethical limits on running uh, any kind of test on human subjects. But uh, just be rude to somebody as a test. I mean, not because you really like that. But just be rude to somebody and what's almost always going to happen. They're going to be rude back, right? And it's not just in, in small social interactions, but generally. How people are treated is how they treat. Uh, and again, it's, and if anything, it's, uh, you know, so often it's a little bit worse than they're treated. So you as a Christian don't have this uh, attitude of pettiness, this attitude of defensiveness, and be mindful of your actions toward others, and uh, this is really, uh, this is, uh, you know, an application of uh, what the law said long ago, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, right? It's loving your, this is, re that's really what the golden rule is. It's just, it is an apply, it's an application of, it's a, full, it's a full application of loving your neighbor as yourself. All right, so I've spoken a while there on, on your, on loving. Uh, any questions, comments? That's right. Did not do any bad thing to them, although I had a list in mind. I, ref I refrained from the entire list of bad things. His tires are all still wired up. <laughs> uh, everything. Yeah. So if you love... And, and as we know, this doing good is, is very much akin to love. Verse 32, if you love only those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Don't even sinners love those who love them? Again, most people reflect. Even sinners reflect back what they've seen and how they're treated. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend only to those who you expect to, from those you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Uh, even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same. But love your enemies, do good. Here's another active list of good. Love your enemies, do good, lend expecting nothing in return. 
and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the, of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. So here's this list of positive again. Love, do good, lend, your reward will be great. Uh, now, it says lend, not expecting to return. Normally, if you lend, not expecting anything in return, what's that called? It's a gift. It's, and now often, if it's, uh, if it's at all possible, uh, I think it should, you, should, you should say it's a gift. Here's a gift. Because then you don't have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about it. Because as soon as you say lend, then you've kind of put an anchor on that thing in, in both your minds. Uh, of, well, you know, I lent that to him and he didn't give it back. Well, I didn't expect it to give it, to, for him to give it back. Uh, now, there are times when you can't do that. There are people who would not accept a gift uh, out of pride, uh, but they would accept a loan. And so, but if it's, if it's at all possible, just practical advice from the preacher here, make it a gift uh, and, and, and let it be just done on the basis of generosity. Also, if you're going to give a gift, Again, just practical advice from the preacher. Do it in the smallest settings possible. Especially if there's been some animosity between you and this other guy. Because if you do it so that people can see that you did it, you're kind of getting into what Jesus got into in Matthew 7. Even if you didn't intend to, you might get there. Where, well, he just gave so everybody could see him do it. Do it, do it privately, do it quietly. But as much as possible, do it as a gift to relieve that burden of mind from both of you. But if they'll only take it as lend, well, do that too. But... In these cases, know that you're doing this to do good. Uh, you're doing this uh, for uh, a good reason because Christ asked you to. Sometimes. And that to me is uh, maybe a little more applicable to you that you're not saying, yes, I want to give this to you. Like I said, they're going to be five people. But if they ask for that, a lot of times if you go ahead and take something off for someone without anyone knowing in your secrecy, that's the gift that really goes back and really come home to a real big. Right. Yeah, the other thing is we're talking here about money. Uh, what you, the way you said the first thing made me think about where people are asking to borrow things of you, not necessarily asking to borrow money, but asking to borrow a tool or a, or a, a useful item. Um, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, I'm known, I, actually I knew one guy, he, he got so tired of one of his neighbors asking him to borrow a certain tool of his, he went down to one of the, it wasn't Harbor Freight back then, but he went down to one of the places that sold cheap tools, and he bought his neighbor the tool that he was always asking to borrow and just gave it to him. Here you go. Just uh, So his good craftsman or, or spot on, uh, snap on or whatever that, what good tools are. <laughs> uh, so, but, but he, again, he was being helpful and mindful. Doesn't mean you have to be taken advantage of. Uh, in these things, but you do have to put yourself at the use of and the benefit of the other person. The great reason to not do this, and if you've ever tried to tell your teenagers, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, maybe, it might, maybe it's not, but if you, ever, if you ever tried to tell your teenagers to have this kind of attitude toward people in, in their so social set or on the edge of their social set who act in unbecoming ways, because, you know, they find that the older you get, the more often you can distance yourself from people that you don't want to be around. Not entirely, but you get, you get more chance at distance, and those teenagers are all thrown together, all of them. But you try to tell them to do this, and one of the things you'll hear back, at least I remember hearing back a lot, was, well, they don't deserve that. Why should I do that for them? They wouldn't do that for me. It's like, well, yeah, that's not the point. Uh, but uh, notice what this is just uh, here, uh, verse 35 do this, you'll be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to ungrateful and evil. The ungrateful and evil. The older translation is kind to evil and ungrateful men. And I often ask, well, what other kind are there? <laughs> Especially those who constantly need your kindness. 
people who live righteously are are good people uh, who are you know faithful disciples are evident uh, show the evidence in their life of that kind of training. A lot of times they're not the ones you need to be kind to, or you're happy to be kind to them. It's no burden at all to be kind to them. It's easy to be kind to them because they're so nice first. And they're so helpful. You wouldn't want to do them harm, of course not. But the people you might want to harm, the people who you could think about doing that evil back to them, those are the ones who really need this kind of attitude shown. And who is the great example? Who show, He shows kindness to evil and ungrateful people. And so what person is beneath this kind of action? What person is disqualified from you applying the golden rule? Well, he's so bad, I don't have to follow the golden rule when I deal with him. And so I tried to teach. I probably should have started earlier, but I, tried, I, I kind of I figured this line of, 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 of uh, you know, rhetoric out a little bit later, but I tried to tell the kids from probably, you know, they're the mid-teens on. It's like, we, 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 have to, we have to follow a no-exception golden rule. It's not a golden rule for some, but for others, they're outside of it. No, we want to follow a no-exception golden rule, right? Well, what if they're evil? What if they're ungrateful? Okay, then be like the sons of your father and do it. That's how, that's how it goes. Be merciful, even your Heavenly Father is merciful. So you can recognize this as merciful. You can recognize that you're you know, walking the extra mile. You can recognize you're doing that. Now, you shouldn't be proud about that. But what do we, what do we find out even in the Old Covenant about mercy? Mercy does what? Triumphs over judgment all right and so uh, we need to be merciful all right now speaking of that the next one is judging judge not that you be not judged condemn not and you'll not be condemned forgive and you'll be forgiven give will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over it will be put into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. All right, again, we start with all these action verbs. In Luke, we get these action verbs piled up much closer together than in, in Matthew, which teaches the same thing, but a longer, a little a longer, more explanation, not quite as forceful with all these action words piled on top of each other. Don't judge, don't condemn, forgive, and give. So two negatives, two positives. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive and give. Now, again, does this require suspension of all judgment? No. It's talking about being censorious or harsh. It's not saying that we've, we've left our moral judgment at the door. Is wrong still wrong and is right still right? Oh, sure it is. What do we just have in the paragraph above? Now, we had people who are not going to give back. Uh, we have people who are enemies. Uh, we have people who, in the paragraph before that, are striking people. Right? All that's still wrong. So a guy strikes you on the cheek, and you turn and let him strike the other cheek, and you say, you know, I'm not going to retaliate, but you really shouldn't have done that. And he goes, well, stop judging me. Why are you judging me for slapping you? Well, you slapped me on both cheeks. Yeah, but you're not supposed to judge. No, that's obviously ridiculous. But what we normally see is the kind of judgment that is, uh, you know, somebody walks by and, well, it's all, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that, you heard what they did? Didn't you hear what they did? Uh, oh, there's that person again. Don't be like that. Harsh, censorious judgment. Instead, generosity of forgiveness. And again, giving. So a generous spirit, not a censorious and harsh spirit. And then it gives the example here of, of, of the way of giving. It, it says, it's good measure, it's pressed down, it's shaking together, it's running over, 
and it's, it, it will be in the lap. What is, what is all that about? What does it mean there? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and then put in, and spilling over or put into the lap. What is that about? Describing the generosity God will give to us or will use with us, right? Um, right. As, I mean, well, what's the whole figure drawn from? You can't even hold it. You right. You everything you can and then do it. Right. Come out the top, it's all over you, and that's how much generosity God will show to you. Okay, so uh, the figure here is of somebody holding out a, a, a cup or a bowl or a container, and either they're at their neighbors getting something, or they're at the market buying something. And how, when, when, you, when you want to buy the bowl full or the, the container full, how full do you want it? So for, what, 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 what for the first thing here is good measure. What's that mean? Measure. Not shorted. It's at least full, right? And like we sometimes uh, will say about it, the thing, we want it kind of heaping, right? We want it kind of stacked up. That's good measure. There's no, there's no shorting there. And then uh, we're going to have it pressed down and shaken together. What's that? <laughs> yes, yeah, right. We might bang it. We might bang it on the table. Uh, we're going to, you know, because like if you buy flour or some other kind of thing, what happens? It'll settle in, right? And then you press it, you can get more in. And so if somebody's coming to get from you, when they leave, how, sh- how full should the container or the bag, or wh- how full should that be? Right? It should be full. It shouldn't be chintzy. It should, you shouldn't have shorted them. It should be the completely full. And so then you, oh, we can get a little more in there, right? We can get a little more in here. If we, you know, pr- pr- pack that in, we can get a little more. Uh, you know, there, there's it's like grandma at the, at the at the Thanksgiving table. No, you have room for more. You can have another. You, you can have another uh, another bite. Uh, you can get a little more. And then running over and into the lap. So the garm, the, the apron, as it were, that you've got under this container in case any spills. We we want to make sure that yeah, some of that spills out, right? We want some of it on your. your this is so full of flour or whatever that some of it is on the apron. Right, they didn't, they're not coming home uh, clean because you've given them so much. They, they've got to get this super full container of whatever back uh, across the the courtyard or or back to home because you've given them that much. Um, I remember, there was a story was about this old farmer and he he uh, uh, his crop was nuts. I forget if it was pecans or walnuts or whatever, and he put he took the fifty pound bags to the store, and and the merchant there was known to be kind of a tightwad. And he measured, he measured the bags. Uh, and, and then after he got done, he, uh, he deducted the weight of the bags. He said, I'm just buying, you know, and the guy kept, what are you doing? Uh, oh, you, I'm only buying the nuts. I'm not buying the bags. So then a couple minutes later, he hears this ruckus in the back of the store. And he asked, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking my bags back home. So he's you know, spilling nuts all over the guy's floor because he didn't pay for the bags. Well, we, we don't want to be that guy, right? Or uh, here's, my, uh, here's my example from an Irish bar. Uh, the, the guy sitting, the, the cheap Irishman, you know, stereotypical uh, cheap Irishman, he, he asks for a full pint, and uh, he gets it, and there's a big head on the top, and he goes, that doesn't look full. He says, she said, yeah, that's full. That's what you get. You got a pint. He said, well, would it be possible, he says, for you to add the weest drop of whiskey in there and sell me a whiskey in my beer. And the waitress says, sure, I can do that. He says, well, take that space and fill it with beer. Because <laughs> he wants it completely full, right? So she, if it's an upcharge, oh, yeah, she can get an extra, you know, half shot of whiskey in there. But if it's just beer, uh, he's, you know. So give him the full amount. All right, that's my one Irish drinking example. All right, so give him the full amount. Now, that's just not about our commerce, but that's about all we do, right? Whatever we're doing, give the full and generous amount. So he tells a parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Or would they not both fall into the pit? 
the disciples, not uh, um, uh, above his teacher, but everyone, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. So here's the thing. If, if you are, if you, if, if, if you're acting in this poor way, this ungenerous way, this unloving way, you're going to be teaching people that, right? And so often don't we see, uh, you know, we see some bad action uh, of a son or we see some bad action. Actually, sometimes I've seen bad action of middle-aged guys and people have been around long enough, what do they say? Just like his daddy, right? Or we see bad action of a little one and what do we say? Just like his daddy or just like his mama. And so we also hopefully say that when we see good things. But here, so be careful who you're having an influence on. And remember who is influencing you. It's God. So why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice a log in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck uh, that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own hypocrite? First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to see clearly the speck in your brother's. And so this is, you know, uh, I, I forget where I saw the quote. Maybe it was Twain, I forget. But it was a quote that no man's conscience is so seared that he can't see the faults of others. Well, we're, we're, So we're real good about seeing the faults of others, but not the faults uh, that, are, that are within us. And so just where are you looking? Are you looking to find fault? Well, if you're looking to find fault in the land of men, what do you find? Not the fault. It's the land of men. That's what, what we do. So don't do that. Don't be harsh. Don't be censorious. Don't try to do the eye surgery on the brother in great detail when there's so obviously things lacking in you. All right, then we've got fruits and trees. For no tree bears, no good tree bears bad fruit. And again, no bad tree bears good fruit. And, you know, that's kind of axiomatic uh, because how do we judge a tree? Literally, we judge it by, I mean, what makes it a bad tree? Well, that tree's not very tall. Well, what, what if you're not very tall, kind of odd-looking tree? What if it's your best producer of apples or pears or lemons or whatever? What do you care? Hey, I don't care. Uh, you just don't care because it'll produce. It's a good producer. What if it's a beautiful tree that doesn't produce? Well, it's a Bradford pear. <laughs> All right. Why don't we plant real pear trees? I, I, I'm not, I'm not, as y'all know me. I'm not one for ornamental uh, horticulture. All right. So uh, that's how we're going to judge. Figs don't come from thorn bushes uh, and grapes don't come from brambles. So the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces what's good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the fruit is from the overflow of life, right? The fruit we see is the product of the life, and it's the fruit that tells. So, I'm, again, I, we're just about the limits of my horticultural knowledge here with these examples. I don't know much about trees, but, I, you know, I can, I, it's a lot easier for me to tell, you know, an orange tree from a pecan tree in the fall, Right? I'm not real good about identifying them maybe in the winter. Uh, I did have an orange tree in my yard for a while. So many oranges we couldn't eat them all. It was that good a producer when we lived in California. But, uh, yeah, that, was, that, that tree produced huge amounts of the best oranges I've ever had, and so much so we couldn't eat them all. Uh, that, that was a really good tree for that. I don't know anything else about it. It was in the yard when we got there. It was in the yard when we left. But it was really good. It was a really good orange tree. The lemon tree near it was pretty good, too. Um, but we can definitely tell things, and you don't have to be an expert to know about fruit, do you? It just doesn't take that much of an expert. Uh, it takes an expert, you know, to identify by leaves and by bark. That might take quite a bit of knowledge about trees, but, you know, fruit. And so we think about the fact that uh, it's so often evident to ev everybody else what a person is, but that person often has the entire different opinion about what they are. Because what are the other people judging? Well, they're your fruit. What are you judging? Well, your intentions or your, your own desires 
or your own, you know, self-deceived uh, opinion of the world. And so Jesus says, look at their fruit. I, I don't know the hearts of people, but I can know their fruits. And so uh, that's how we ought to go. All right, uh, questions or comments there on fruits or trees. All right, so Jesus is pretty practical here. Your, your actions will out. Lastly, build your house on the rock. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you? Good question. Because by saying Lord, what are you admitting? Authority. But you're not acting like they have authority. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them. So you come, again, these action verbs. You come, you hear, you do. I'll show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. The floods rose, the stream broke against the house. It didn't shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and doesn't do, so they're both hearing, but that's where the similarity stops, and doesn't do them is like the man who built his house on ground without a foundation. When the stream broke out, it it immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Have you actually ever been in a house that didn't have a foundation? Once in my life, uh, an elderly and very poor sister in Christ lived in a house that was built, it was basically built like a shed on the ground. It was one bedroom, one kitchen, one living room, kind of shaped like an L. A few years before I knew her, uh, she'd had all kinds of problems with her bathroom. Her toilet basically fell through what little bit of floor there was. There was no so hardly any subfloor. There was no foundation. It was just right on the right on the clay down on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And the brethren who helped her out and had got it where they could have a toilet that would be. You know, they basically had to build a foundation for the toilet and um, and, and plumb that back together uh, where she could live in that house. And it was all she had. She lived in dire poverty. Um, but she, it was unbelievable. This, this house with, had literally no foundation. Um, doors didn't close, right? Because, you know, you walk across the floor. And the and, uh, only thing I've ever been in in this country or a house literally had no foundation. But spiritually and morally, what are we building when we don't actually follow what Jesus says? We're building that kind of structure. And you don't want to live, you know, you don't want to live there. Uh, one of the things about building a little, you know, uh, a shack of a house, and it wasn't much but an upgraded shack, really, what she lived in. One of the things about a thing like that is you can put it up cheaply, right? And for the first, uh, literally, quite decades it was there, it kind of got by, right? But the longer it, le- the longer it went, the longer it was there, the worse it got, right? And how would you fix it? Where would you even start to fix it? You couldn't, right? You just couldn't fix that place. Um, so a, a life without the wor- uh, words of Jesus fo- being followed, it's like that. Can you start off a life like that and it seems like it's going okay for a while? I guess. But the longer you go, the worse and worse this is going to get. And then eventually it'll fall. And not long after she passed away, the family just came in and knocked it over. And it was in an area surrounded by some industrial things. And they sold it to one of the neighboring businesses so they could expand a parking lot or something. But, yeah, it it was a terrible place to live. Lovely lady. Terrible place to live. Okay. Questions, comments?
Yeah, we know there are some times, we, we know the reaction immediately, like when he's telling, you know, lessons about uh, uh, people who trusted their self-righteous or people that trusted in money, and we know the negative reaction. At this, we're not sure. We, we, we can presume, I think, that there was a few with uh, honest hearts, like Nicodemus, uh, among, that, among that crowd who would have agreed with a lot and uh, been in sympathy with it. But uh, unfortunately, the majority of them, probably even if they recognize the truth to some of this, uh, were uh, so wrapped up in their partisan issues that they were blinded to everything else that was going on. We know that's true about the Pharisees oftentimes. Yeah, I think that, that right. To the Nicodemus is, yeah. to that Nicodemus minority, but yeah, to the majority, it probably just would have 